start recording. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to make sure that all our ducks in a row. So I'm looking at my screen and making sure that the meeting is being recorded. Making sure that the Q&A panel is open and yes it is. Looks like we have nine attendees so far. And you are actually welcome uh, for those attendees that are with us um, just to let us know who you are when you ask comments or just to say hello. And I think I will begin. Let's see the time. The time is 631. We have 12 attendees, so it looks like people are coming in. 15 attendees now. Jonathan, approximately how many? Uh, we should we should probably have somewhere between 30 and 40 when everyone's logged in. Right. But uh, I have some maybe I know some some did mention they had other meetings and um, they'd right. be kind of logging at, di at different points. I have 14 attendees. Let me see if I get one or two more. And uh, I don't want to I want to honor everybody's time. Promise we will be done by eight. I think I'm going to begin. What I'm going to do is um, put up the PowerPoint. Looks like we, we have uh, 12 attendees so far, Jonathan. Yeah. But I'm going to go ahead and start. And I will do introductions and all of that, so. Let me see. Thank you everybody for your patience. I patience. I want to make sure I don't see the PowerPoint up there. I still see me. And there's Bridget. And why can't I share this PowerPoint? Let me stop sharing for a minute. Let me try it again. There it is. Gladys, let me know when you're ready. Yes. OK, now it looks like I'm going to Begin. So good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. I think all of us know each other, but I am Gladys Bourdouin. I'm an integrated project planner in planning and evaluation, and I'll be serving as moderator during our virtual time together. With us tonight is Bridget Lodge, Assistant Superintendent of the Department of Teaching and Learning and Jonathan Teresi, Director of Strategic Planning. You will get to hear from them. They'll go through a presentation and you'll also get to see their faces when we go through the Q&A session. Just so you know, let me go to the next slide. I will be um, looking for your questions and comments on the Q&A box. And just go ahead and put your Q&A box. I think you do have to submit for your questions, your comments, your feedback. Um, and then we're going to address those at the end of the presentation that we have prepared for you tonight. I want to mention to the interpreters that are listening in, please type in the questions that come into you in the Q&A box as well so that I can let my colleagues know when those questions come in. And so I'll begin by turning it over to Bridget. And Bridget, I am uh, presenting the presentation right now. Great. Well, I want to thank everybody for um, for joining in tonight. Uh, at least it's indoors and online instead of outside in, in the, the cold, freezing rain. So uh, we're very glad. I know your time is, is really precious. And so we're very glad that you're able to join us tonight to talk about the uh, instructional programs and pathways. Um, so you'll see on, on your screen, uh, we'll be sharing sort of the purposes and goals of the IPP. And this is a brief uh, recap from the December update. 
Um, we'll talk about our existing APS programs, some criteria and evaluations, and an audit that we're um, proposing needs to happen. Uh, I'll share the visioning process, which again is a, um, a recap from December. And uh, then we'll talk about some uh, suggestions from instructional leaders and the community engagement process. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, please, Gladys. And I can go to the next slide too. All right, so let's talk a bit about the uh, instructional programs and pathways. Um, we've, uh, as you uh, probably are aware at this point, it's really the IPP is a framework and it's meant to define the role of our neighborhood schools, our option schools, and all of our instructional programs. And uh, we realized uh, when we began this process that what was missing is a, a really a comprehensive list and a description of our current programs and options pre-K to adult uh, in a centralized location. So the IPP will serve to um, uh, fill that gap. Um, the IPP really provides a, a clear instructional vision for the future, and that aligns with our strategic plan, our mission, our vision, and the new equity policy. And you can see on the slide uh, that this really could include recommendations to expand programs, to make changes to existing programs, to introduce new programs, maybe move programs, consolidate them. It's really based on what are the instructional needs of um, our students and uh, how can instruction lead our long-term planning. Um, the other piece that is uh, different than, um, uh, or new, I should say, that than um, what was not included in the original IPP is it really identifies the criteria for assessing our instructional programs in our IPP. We have not, up until this point, had an opportunity to take a look at our existing programs and make sure that they're reflecting um, our vision, our mission, and our strategic plan. And it will also serve as a mechanism to screen any new programs that are uh, proposed as part of a visioning process. Gladys, next slide. So um, we want to share why the IPP is important. As I talked about, this really creates a framework for uh, making decisions around instructional visioning that then inform APS planning initiatives. Uh, and those planning initiatives are the capital improvement plan known as the CIP, our boundary processes, and the Arlington facilities and student accommodations plan. So the idea is that the IPP is going to lead, put instruction in front of these um, uh, planning initiatives. It's also um, uh, inform, will be informed and is informed um, by uh, instructional processes, and that includes curriculum development, our program evaluations, and our program of studies. Um, so one of the key strategic plan goals uh, is to provide multiple pathways for student success, and the IPP will define our current options for our students, as well as the vision for the future to help achieve that goal. And it also aligns with the Virginia profile of the graduate, um, the strategic plan and our new equity policy uh, to ensure equity and access while providing ex educational excellence for our students, whether they attend a neighborhood school or access a specific instructional program or option school. Next slide, please. So um, really in, in a nutshell, our goals are to ensure equity and access to also ensure multiple pathways and to strengthen existing pathways in our K-12 programs and to take a look at the need for additional K-12 uh, pathways. It's meant to promote demographic diversity in our programs and schools and assist with managing enrollment at all of our school levels. So let's talk about our existing APS programs. As you can see on this uh, chart here, uh, it runs the gamut from our programs in our pre-K to adults, and um, I think it's really important to emphasize that in APS, we're not a K-12 school system. We're pre-K to uh, serving uh, many st uh, students who uh, continue on with us or join us as adults. Um, you can see the general education um, uh, programs uh, that are listed at the top row. Our English learner programs are in the middle row, and I want to emphasize that uh, these uh, learner programs are often not uh, separate and apart, especially when you look at our elementary, our middle, and our high school. They're incorporated in uh, each of those schools, but we wanted to highlight um, uh, our existing English learner programs 
particularly since um, uh, with our DOJ uh, settlement agreement and with the L program evaluation, we've been focusing a great deal on um, providing quality instruction for our English learners. And then you'll see at the bottom, again, our special education programs, many of which are integrated in our existing elementary, middle, and high school um, um, programs and studies. Uh, but again, we wanted to highlight them, particularly in the context of the five-year special education action plan. So um, what you see here is a scope and sequence of our programs that we offer all of our students. Next, next slide. So um, we uh, talked about program criteria and how can we evaluate um, sort of the efficacy of our instructional programs. Um, the I IPP really uh, articulates um, the, prog uh, the program criteria and our staff is, is continuing to do that. This is part of as we've developed this process and this framework throughout this school year, um, that the process of identifying the criteria is continuing and we'll be able to share an update with the school board in March. The evaluation piece is um, really coming out of our program evaluation um, process, which has um, been in place for several years. Uh, it's a partnership between the Department of Teaching and Learning and Planning and Evaluation. And uh, we plan to apply the program of our elements of the program evaluation process to our um, schools. So um, as it goes through this process, some cases the programs are already being evaluated. Um, for example, our world languages program evaluation has just completed and uh, you'll learn more about that at the next um, school board meeting. Uh, but it, within that program evaluation includes the dual language immersion program. So that's uh, those are existing programs at, at Key and Claremont, at Gunston and at Wakefield and they're um, folded into the world languages program evaluation. Sometimes, though, a separate program evaluation may need, uh, may need to be needed. Um, and when we get to more normalized operations, uh, we'll share a timeline for this work. Recommended from the program evaluations will inform the visioning work. And uh, you'll see as an example, our five year special education action plan is uh, has several recommendations for um, existing uh, programs and for our visioning process on how we can improve our uh, instructional delivery and supports for our students uh, with disabilities. Next slide, please. So this is uh, one of those new highlights from uh, the IPP as it's evolved, and uh, that is that we've done an audit of our current instructional programs, and looking at a three-year trend of the number of students enrolled, the demographics um, of our students enrolled in various uh, options and programs, those uh, students assigned neighborhood school, and the data from the uh, options and transfers webpage, and it, that includes the number of applicants to each program and the number of students on the wait list. And this, uh, by the way, another new um, opportunity to get more information is that we do have an IPP Engage page. So this information is available for you. We plan to use this, um, uh, this uh, information from the audit to, to identify specific student groups who might be under or overrepresented in certain programs, um, and also to help inform uh, areas of needs. And it also helps us to um, determine targeted outreach to ensure that our community um, is aware of existing programs and how to access it. So once we know um, who and, and who attends our, our programs, that helps inform some next steps. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the IPP visioning process. And you're going to see what uh, this is one of two cycles. So I want to remind you that um, we've really taken time this year to flesh out um, what does the IPP framework look like. And in doing so, we've identified um, a cycle that you see illustrated here. But we want to emphasize that the IPP is always evolving. It's dynamic and it's fluid. Um, and and at each uh, sort of stage or in the in the cycle, that gives us an opportunity to provide updates to the school board, to provide updates to the community and our instructional leaders as well. So if I could kind of take you through here in the development of the IPP cycle, uh, you know, last year in summer and in September, we started with some visioning sessions. We had a work session with the school board in October, and then we met with instructional leaders in November to really um, 
um, highlight uh, some areas of immediate need uh, that Jonathan will share with you um, in just a moment. Then um, in December, we met with uh, advisory committees at CCPTA and um, other community um, advisory groups. Um, we uh, continued uh, to meet and we had several work sessions with our instructional leaders to continue the development. And then we had a monitoring report just last week uh, to the school board and, and we're uh, kicking off our, our um, robust community engagement process. We come back to the school board in March where uh, Dr. Duran then makes some recommendations based on the proposals that um, uh, were, were developed in consultation with the community and the instructional leaders. Um, and, then, uh, and then we're off to the races again in April through June, looking at the next set of um, uh, initiatives uh, that needed to be brought forward in the IPP. So now that we've uh, sort of talked through the cycle of the, the development of the framework of the IPP, uh, Gladys, if you could take us to the next slide. Now we're going to show you what does this look like, this continuous dynamic uh, process look like uh, in any given year. So again, we start with visioning sessions with our instructional leaders and, and meetings with the school board in the summer and into September. We continue to work with our instructional leaders to finalize recommendations um, and likely we'll be sharing a monitoring report with the board in October and that's really strategic because as many of you know, the budget process starts long before January. So we wanna be signaling to the board if there are some recommendations that may have some, some uh, funding implications. Um, we'll continue to, to get um, input from our advisory committees, our CCPTA and the community in November, come back with our instructional leaders. So kind of doing that dipstick check as we move along with um, each step do another monitoring report in mid-January, and that helps to inform the budget and the, C the CIP. And then we continue with the cycle in um, um, refining and then identifying a new initiatives. So as you can see, there's not a static moment where we stop and we say, we're done. Uh, it's an ongoing process. So that kind of walks you through uh, the framework of um, our IPP. Now we want to turn our attention to um, some specific um, uh, proposals that have been brought forward by our instructional leaders and, um, and uh, share with you how you can share feedback. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Jonathan. Jonathan, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, as Bridget mentioned, we had some uh, visioning sessions with our instructional leaders beginning in November through January. And what we are sharing is some, are, some of their initial thinking. Uh, the suggestions, again, came in January. And this month is really dedicated to getting input from our stakeholders on some of the concepts and ideas that were uh, shared. And as Bridget mentioned, in, in March, the superintendent will be bringing forth recommendations. Um, the implementation, again, if a vision is adopted, if there is support from the school board, uh, we will begin a, a timeline for implementation, resources needed, and continued stakeholder input. This is really the beginning of a process. Uh, our communications and timing and details will be shared throughout uh, in, in an inclusive way so that everyone is informed. Next slide, please. So the, as we met with leaders in the fall and began to shape out our work for the this school year uh, in terms of this the, this year's cycle of vision um, for the IPP, five priority areas kind of rose to the top. The Education Center, um, the building next to Washington uh, Liberty uh, was one area. Um, as we looked at projections for uh, Washington Liberty and the capacity that the Ed Center uh, will have when it comes online next year, there are some opportunities there um, to you know, look at how we might utilize that building to its fullest extent to meet our division wide needs and student needs. And so we'll be sharing a suggestion on that that came from our leaders. We also leaders also looked at the alternative and special ed programs uh, at Langston, our 45 day academic academy. Uh, these are some of our smaller secondary programs that are spread across several sites in the county. And so instructional leaders looked at uh, does it make sense instructionally? Would it meet the student needs? Are there any opportunities um, to consider around co-locating or consolidating any of these programs? So that was another topic that was discussed. 
Uh, talk, uh, leaders also talked about neighborhood schools and how they fit into the IPP. Uh, the first iteration of the IPP back two years ago was really focused on uh, six programs uh, that have kind of a K-12 pathway. And so we really brought in the scope of it. And with that, thinking um, of uh, how, how neighborhood schools will fit into this framework, because they are, again, the core of our instructional program. 75 to 80% of our students will go through the neighborhood schools, uh, their K-12 experience. So that is very important. Um, and leaders also talked about the English learner programs at Langston Career Center, Arlington Community High School, and HB Woodlawn. Um, the, the core group that are served in these programs are, are 18 to 22 year old English learner students, uh, many of whom uh, enter APS for the first time at, at that age and are working towards a diploma. Uh, the traditional high school is, is not, um, you know, for many of those students, uh, doesn't offer the same degree of flexibility as some of these programs. And so as our leaders uh, talked more about uh, how can these programs continue to best meet student needs and similar to above, are there any uh, consideration on opportunities for co-locating or consolidating any, again, in the hopes that it would you know, strengthen the program, meet the student needs, and potentially offer some efficiencies to our school division in terms of staffing, um, uh, transportation, and uh, budget. And the last topic they discussed was middle school seats, looking at our seat needs at the middle school level over the next three to five years, and um, some ideas for helping manage enrollment um, and an instructional vision for that. So we will share, uh, next slide please, that these suggestions, again, were all aimed um, at strengthening the program, meeting the needs of the students, aligning with our core values and strategic plan goals, strengthening some of our existing pathways or creating new pathways, and offering potential cost savings and efficiencies in one or more areas. Uh, the suggestions you're going to hear about in the next slides would be considered for implementation no sooner than 2022-23 uh, or a later date. Some of these may take uh, a much longer time to implement if there's a support and, and we move forward in that direction. Again, we want to make sure there's adequate time to plan to have an inclusive process and build into our budget and CIP cycle as needed. And again, as Bridget mentioned, the final recommendations, what you're seeing tonight are suggestions. The final recommendations will be made at the end of March at the school board meeting following our community engagement process. Next slide, please. So the Ed Center, uh, as instructional leaders looked at the Ed Center and opportunities, one suggestion they had uh, was to look at uh, creating a virtual learning program for students at the secondary level that would serve grades students 6 through 12. There are uh, four floors at the Ed Center, and the idea would be um, to use, actually there are five, including the ground level, to use one of those floors for a virtual learning program. Um, another suggestion was to consider co-locating Academic Academy, which is currently at the Career Center, co-locating that with Langston at the Langston site. Another suggestion um, was uh, in regards to our English learner programs to conduct a visioning process to develop a clearer vision for these four programs to really look before we can determine if co-locating or consolidating would achieve those goals that I mentioned on the previous slide. So again, doing a deeper dive, kind of looking more critically at those programs to see how we can help uh, strengthen uh, and, and if any of consolidation or co-locating would achieve those goals. Uh, neighborhood schools really just reinforcing that they are the core of APS, that the neighborhood schools provide a community hub for the people that live in the neighborhood and uh, other activities. It's not just a school that we know they serve evening uh, sports events on the fields. It really is that community hub. So that was just kind of helping reinforce that message. Next slide. And in regards to middle school seats, so these were uh, four suggestions from instructional leaders that we should consider. Uh, making Montessori Public School a pre-K to 8 school, that a future CIP process should consider co-locating it with a middle school. That means placing it next to one. Um, co-locating with a middle school ensures that the students in the program would have access to a range of courses taught by teachers with secondary level certification. Uh, just as a note, uh, the, the students in Montessori uh, 6 to 8, that program is currently housed at Gunston. So the idea would be that the program moves back to MPSA and it becomes pre-K to eight. 
uh, align our programs with our K-12 feeder schools and um, that are equitable countywide. So considering whether any program moves or expansions to additional sites would improve uh, access, particularly for our communities that are underserved. Uh, creating similar to what you saw for the Ed Center, creating a virtual learning program for our secondary students. Uh, as we've seen, um, even our students in grades six through eight have been experiencing high levels of success and some may prefer to continue in that environment. So do we, uh, should we consider looking at opportunities to uh, continue and expand that? And the last suggestion was to reopen. I say reopen because it was formally open to transfers, but reopen the art and communication technology program at Kenmore back up to the lottery. Um, as you look at the capacities across the schools, um, when that program was open, it, it was attracting students from the Gunston and um, Thomas Jefferson Middle School attendance zone. Those schools are increasingly over capacity and this could be one mechanism in addition to creating a pathway for students also provide some capacity relief. Um, next slide. So in terms of community engagement, next slide. As with those suggestions, they we we felt as though they, they fall into kind of one of four buckets. Uh, this idea of realigning, co-locating or combining programs, creating a K to eight school, creating a virtual learning program for secondary students, and then considering opening or reopening programs to transfer when operationally feasible. Uh, and so the, the community questionnaire that we have developed and that we'll push out next week uh, provides community members an opportunity to provide feedback on those four general areas above. As we thought about the questionnaire, um, some of these programs, uh, some of the suggestions are highly specific and we understand that some members of our community may not be familiar with them. So uh, it, it might be, we thought it was best to get input on these um, vi larger visions and concepts to help inform our work and share that feedback back with instructional leaders. Uh, at the same time, we will be engaging in targeted outreach to school communities that would be most directly impacted by the suggestions shared in the monitoring report and we'll gather feedback and respond to questions. For example, Academic Academy, we will be meeting with staff and families there, the MPSA community, Kenmore, those other ones who are specifically mentioned in the suggestions, we will be doing some targeted outreach to really ensure that we are responding to any questions or concerns they have. Uh, this community feedback that we gather this month from both the questionnaire, from our community meetings, our open office hours, and this targeted outreach, it will be considered by APS staff as they prepare their final recommendations to the superintendent. We're really being thoughtful and inclusive and in allocating uh, this whole month really to gathering that input to uh, help inform. Uh, next slide. So what are the opportunities, uh, the plan for the whole community? We have the virtual meeting tonight with our advisory groups and the PTA leaders. Uh, we will be launching the questionnaire. It's going to be need a few more days. We um, the translation part uh, is taking a little bit longer, so we will uh, want to push that out when all of that is ready. Um, tomorrow night is our first virtual community presentation, and then uh, next Wednesday we'll also have the same presentation. That same information will be presented at both nights and we're also offering simultaneous interpretation in four other languages for uh, the community to act and make it accessible. Uh, the following week, February 22nd and the 24th, we have a virtual open office hour where no formal presentation, but just a chance for people to log in and ask questions in English and Spanish. And um, we will record and post all of these meetings online for the community to access. Next slide. And as you saw at the bottom, our engage page for the IPP, it will continue to be the information hub. Uh, all key information, presentations, links to recordings, frequently asked questions, all of that will be there. So it'll be one stop shopping for our community um, to get information about the IPP and its developments and to share uh, input through the questionnaire and, and uh, engage. We will use a variety of communication channels. Again, our virtual community meetings, uh, news releases, school talks, social media, um, all, all of our, our uh, different mediums to uh, help reach our community. And we met with our bilingual family resource assistants today. Uh, we realized the important role they play in, in our school communities and helping reach and connect with some of our families um, and uh, will help us uh, again, get the word out and, and get them um, to share their input in this process and answer any questions they might have. 
So just a, uh, a little preview of next steps. So following this process in March, once we conclude with the monitoring report, we will start our next IPP visioning cycle. Uh, two things we have up on the deck in that cycle is our dual language immer immersion program is slated for a visioning process. Uh, next week, there will be um, a presentation to the school board. The world language depart um, program underwent a program evaluation over the last uh, few years, and that report is complete. And so with that information, we were we we're going to dive deep into the dual language immersion program and look at opportunities there uh, to continue to strengthen and move that program forward. Another major topic on, on the agenda for um, the next process is the career center site with Arlington Tech and looking at the visioning uh, for that there. Um, so we will continue to uh, work on those two areas. Some additional areas could be identified between now and then, but we wanted to just give you a preview of a couple of things that are on deck, um, you know, starting in April and uh, the next process. So that concludes the uh, presentation por portion. I'm going to turn it back over to Gladys. Gladys, if you wouldn't mind maybe just previewing how to access the, I I've got a few emails about how to access the Q&A box and chat. Oh, I think you're on mute, Gladys. Ha ha, that should be the word of 2021 as well, because it was the word for 2020. Um, I'm going to go through the Q&A box. I've published a few, and I'm going to um, start with a few. Bridget looks so pretty. I'm going to send her live. And as far as the Q&A box, there is, it's a Q&A box, and then you, you, I have received a lot of them, but it looks like some folks who are on the phone may not be able to access the Q&A box. For those who are listening in on the phone, this recording will be available. You can also email your questions to engage, E-N-G-A-G-E -E, at APSVA.us. Um, I can see if I can gain access to it now um, while we do this. Um, but if not, we will be sure to check it right after this and answer those questions for you. I'm sorry that if you're listening in by phone, um, thanks Jillian for, for letting us know that, that you're not able to uh, do the Q&A box, but know that engage at APSVA.us is also another mechanism. Um, and I'm going to begin by going through some questions. Uh, so Bridget, to clarify, Currently, APS is reworking the IPP framework, and then once the framework is approved, it will be used each year to guide the annual cycle of evaluation programs, adding or changing or deleting programs, developing the budget. Is that correct? Right, absolutely. So if you recall that second cycle uh, that I walked us through, that's really what's going to be happening um, uh, as we move forward with the IPP. As I've said, uh, we spent uh, much of this year really um, firming up the framework for the IPP and um, we're launching into a, a cycle now um, of our instructional leaders identifying key initiatives, uh, us bringing it uh, to the community for feedback and, and engagement and then uh, bringing it to the board ultimately uh, for them to make some decisions moving forward. And then as Jonathan said, We'll start again uh, in April and moving into the summer and identifying uh, key initiatives and um, uh, then having our instructional leaders weigh in and, and share it with the community. So yes, absolutely, we'll uh, continue to cycle now that we've um, sort of finalized our framework. Um, Bridget, we mentioned a virtual learning program um, as being uh, something that the instructional leaders suggested. The question is, why does a virtual learning program require uh, classroom space? Sure, yeah, and I, I do think one of the silver linings of um, engaging in distance learning uh, for uh, much of this school year is our teachers have um, really uh, learned some innovative strategies and, and kind of figured out how to deliver instruction in an engaging way uh, via distance learning. And then we've also come to recognize that there are many students out there who um, value the opportunity to continue learning um, uh, sort of from a, a virtual perspective. That said, 
Um, we do think it's also important uh, for students to have access to, um, you know, counseling support, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, potentially to have um, a hybrid uh, model in which um, students are uh, having uh, blended learning, you know, uh, doing some of their learning online and then working uh, in, um, in, in person with their teachers. So we do want to be able to establish room uh, for students who might participate in this virtual learning um, program such that they also can come and um, uh, access internet. Uh, connectivity has been um, um, sporadic uh, for some of our students and so we want to be able to give them a place where they have guaranteed uh, connectivity that they might be able to access counseling services and supports that's uh, more dynamic and engaging in person um, and perhaps have um, support from a live teacher as well. Thank you. Jonathan, I have a couple of questions um, for you. Um, in your visioning sessions with instructional leaders and other groups, did you share your data findings before or as part of the in introduction of these visioning processes? For example, did you identify programs as either under or overrepresented groups within a program? Absolutely. No, thank you. Uh, so in November, we uh, once we identified our priority areas, we provided data and some guiding questions to instructional leaders and gave them time to think about that. Uh, before we pulled together in, in visioning sessions in the future months. So at the onset, yes, they were given the data and some guiding questions. And during the sessions themselves, we did dig into some of the data. And uh, that program audit is available on the IPP Engage page. If you scroll down to the bottom, there's data sources you will see. And so that's publicly available for all to kind of see the demographics and breakdown of the various programs. Uh, but instructional leaders did consult that. That was reviewed um, as part of the process. And we are um, continuing to look at areas of over and under representation. Um, in some cases, it's information that we've you know, known, and now we have some kind of quantifiable trends over a three year period that we will continue to make plans. As Bridget uh, mentioned in the first part, it's a cyclical process. We didn't get to everything in this cycle, but we are building a work plan to address all of our areas of need. Um, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Great, thank you. Um, let me go back up. Jonathan, what are you hoping to receive in terms of feedback from the community? Validation of the recommendations, finding errors or sharing new ideas, value judgments from various communities? Thank you, yeah, so the, the questionnaire um, well, the questionnaire is just one term, one place of input, but I think hearing uh, some questions and concerns always uh, is, is helpful. The questionnaire does ask, you know, for example, on the virtual learning program, do you, is that a vision that you support? Is that a vision uh, you do not support or something uh, you have no, and then there's, uh, or no opinion on that. So there is a chance for people to, you know, share their input on the questionnaire in terms of uh, if something they support, don't support. And there's also an open comment box. So uh, in terms of sharing uh, new ideas or other, uh, that's definitely welcomed that um, we do provide that form. There is an open kind of comment box on the questionnaire. And, and during our uh, meetings, when we have these virtual community meetings, any and all questions, you know, are welcome and, uh, you know, feedback. That's what this is process is for. And then when we engage in the targeted outreach, you know, like I mentioned, engaging with the MPSA community or um, others who would be directly impacted by these suggestions, uh, really responding to the questions and concerns that uh, folks may have. So really gathering feedback from a variety of ways to, to then bring back to leaders to uh, so they can hear, you know, the areas of uh, support or not support and uh, the visions and then also uh, some common questions and concerns that folks may have um, from different constituency groups across the county. Jonathan, are the um, are the community meetings about creating the IPP framework or are they about the four possibilities for addressing middle school seats? They're really tied into those those four areas, um, not just middle school seats, um, but looking at more broadly than that, looking, as I mentioned, the virtual learning program, 
reopening some programs um, to back up to the lottery for and available for transfer. Um, all of those areas are really areas of input. Um, and again, there, there'll be opportunities um, at the end of the questionnaire um, to provide any new ideas or suggestions that may not have been captured in prior comments. So if there's something in the questionnaire that didn't quite get at, you know, uh, a suggestion or comment or feedback, um, there's an opportunity for people to share that too, and that will be reviewed. Okay, and I think this, I think you've um, mentioned this already. It's all about another question on the questionnaire. Will the community questionnaire have more concrete or details or examples of the five proposals? Um, let me just read the, there's a comments within. I think without more details and examples, the questionnaire will will only be able to garner useful information and responses from the top tier of, of you know, parents who are involved. So I guess the question is, will it have concrete details and examples? So maybe you mm -hmm. want to talk about the questionnaire, um, but Jonathan also talk about some of that engagement, that targeted um, engagement and knowledge of the programs. Yes, absolutely. So we are um, continuing to build an archive of resources and, and really making it accessible to the community. In the questionnaire design, when we work with our evaluation team, um, we've included some links in the questionnaire to the engage page for folks to read more. Um, we we are building in some uh, some contextualization to help uh, folks, but also to kind of link back to the engage page to uh, help educate and inform families of the different um, areas you know that are covered in it. So I, I think it's a, a, a great point and suggestion and we are trying to find that gap between uh, that bridge between not making the questionnaire too lengthy and text heavy because we know that can also be you know alienating to certain communities while also giving enough information to uh, be able to provide uh, feedback. So we are um, mindful of that and, and do have some links embedded um, to help provide more information for families before they complete it. Thank you. I um, have a couple of questions for Bridget. Thank you, Bridget, for unmuting. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Bridget, um, key immersion will be extremely We'll be over capacity in the ATS building and Claremont Immersion is going to be over capacity. That's their statement. APS staff has repeat has said that capacity for the immersion schools will be dealt through the IPP. How is it that immersion is not one of the five priorities for this year? Sure, so I'm going to uh, back up a little bit and then uh, then slide into uh, the responding to that question. Um, if you recall when I was talking about the evaluation process that um, uh, our world languages program uh, has just completed its um, a five year plus evaluation process. And as part of that, um, the dual language uh, program uh, uh, was included in the world languages program evaluation. And some of the outcomes of that program evaluation were that we really needed to be looking at um, our instructional delivery within our dual language program. Um, and uh, so Elizabeth Harrington, our world languages supervisor has begun uh, some of that visioning work um, with our instructional leaders and um, uh, and that began in the fall and is moving through uh, the winter and uh, then um, our planning and evaluation um, uh, department will be um, assisting with um, a task force and visioning work for the actual instructional program. Um, so that's happening in the spring, and the expectation is then that the uh, the immersion capacity um, combined with the immersion visioning will really um, take place uh, moving into April and into the summer. So uh, yes, you're right that it wasn't um, included in the, the five areas that um, our instructional leaders identified as, as really pressing um, for this part of the cycle, but will absolutely um, be uh, continued as part of the IPP in the April through the summer um, with the expectation in bringing to the uh, the board some recommendations um, in, in the fall. And I can just add on a little bit to that too. Just um, so as we we presented, we did present to the Key and Claremont community a few weeks back 
uh, to give them a preview of the visioning process. And really, um, our messaging was around to uh, maintain minimal changes for next year while this visioning process takes place. So in terms of the feeder structure, for example, the only change was that Ashlawn uh, has, uh, has been reassigned to the key. Um, the ATS building is in the Ashlawn attendance zone, and so students from Ashlawn uh, would be assigned to um, the ATS key at the ATS site, uh, key immersion. But we are also allowing those families to continue at Claremont if they so choose um, for next year. So we are providing that option to keep students in their current communities. So again, what in the um, knowing that this visioning process is coming up, we really made minimal changes. Our facilities department and uh, planning and evaluation are working closely around the buildings and facilities uh, to ensure, uh, you know, um, safety and ensure operations for next year. Uh, and, and absolutely, the IPP process will help inform a lot of decisions um, moving forward uh, for beginning in the 2022-2023 school year to take effect then. Thank you both. Bridget, I have one other question. Is this process assuming the neighborhood schools where we, is this process assuming that neighborhood schools will remain the same? You know, it was really important as we uh, talked a lot uh, in the IPP process about our option schools and programs uh, that we acknowledge that our neighborhood schools are really sort of the cornerstone of um, our school system. You know, 75% of our students attend a neighborhood school. Uh, you uh, saw the, the, that acknowledgement that, of the value that our neighborhood schools bring, um, and we felt it was important to acknowledge that as part of um, the process and, and talking about our, um, our option schools. That said, as we as the IPP process continues, uh, there may come a time when we need to take a look at the um, instructional delivery in our um, and the curriculum in our uh, delivered in our neighborhood schools to ensure that uh, it is aligning with our strategic uh, plan and our vision and our mission. So I wouldn't say it would remain the same, but I would say that um, the inclusion of the neighborhood schools for now was to, was really meant to acknowledge how important they are um, and that we don't anticipate that there would be um, a change occurring to our neighborhood schools, at least in the next um, um, several IPP cycles. Um, during the school board meeting, Jonathan mentioned that you would be going back to the original IPP document because all of that work had been done with the community. Uh, is that document the starting point? So um, I will say that when we started uh, uh, with our instructional leaders to look at um, uh, what initiatives they felt were pressing, we absolutely included um, some of the, the examples of um, um, instructional, pro, new instructional programs that were included in the initial IPP document. Um, and uh, we ended up with a list of about 17 um, areas of focus. Uh, and then we worked closely with our instructional leaders to identify which areas of focus really needed our time and attention now um, uh, as we developed the framework and, and kicked off the first cycle of the IPP. Um, uh, the uh, Several of the, the programs that were identified in the original document didn't make that first list, uh, but they are continuing to be part of uh, the areas of focus that we'll, we'll bring forward with our um, instructional leaders moving into uh, the next several cycles of the IPP. Thank you, Bridget. Jonathan, as part of the evaluation process, has APS asked families why they choose or didn't choose certain programs? Uh, did that, and as far as that effort, if we did that, um, how, how did we ensure that it reached all types of families, those questions? Yeah, I think um, in the evaluation process, um, there, there, it's a three-phase process, and in the beginning, there's kind of a design committee, and as they look at the pro, uh, evaluation design, uh, at times, depending on the, the program, they may choose to include to collect that types of data, uh, and it really is program specific. Um, so it's not a, a set requirement. I think it is helpful data, but I do. Uh, I think it does vary uh, from program evaluation to program evaluation. Those committees, those design committees are inclusive. A variety of stakeholders are part of them. 
uh, as they kind of set up the design for the evaluation and, and what data they will collect and um, which groups they will obtain that from. So I think it does vary, uh, but I do think it is helpful information as we continue to build out the IPP and look at it. Uh, things like focus groups and questionnaires to folks I think are helpful. Um, I know one thing we will be doing just to relate it back to something that was shared in this presentation as part of the dual language immersion visioning process, we are identifying you know, some of the areas of underrepresentation and issues with attrition, and we'll be in engaging and in, in getting some more info on that to help inform to make plans uh, to address those areas of need. So that will absolutely be part of the work. Um, I think the, the formal program evaluations um, really do vary, but as we hone in on specific topic areas in the IPP, those are considerations that we will be uh, putting forth to the, leader, the leaders. Jonathan, um, as far as the demographic data for the programs mm -hmm. at the high school program level, it mainly presents the numbers from the home neighborhood high schools. How much more detailed will the data be? So the so that the format is the format is not the easiest to decipher right now. Yeah, it, it is. It is technical. Um, there, there is. Um, so one of the tabs on the data sheet that we shared <clears throat> includes the program. It includes a, a three year. A, there's a three year trend of enrollment, and then that enrollment is disaggregated and broken down by race, um, so uh, free and reduced lunch. Um, and they're just numbers, um, and uh, so that's not, you know, obviously student specific or identifiable, but just in the aggregate. Um, looking at our English learner composition, um, students with disabilities, uh, the uh, gifted, uh, all of those, that's one tab. And on the second tab, it shows the neighborhood schools that feed into that program. So, for example, at, at ATS, for example, where the students who attend Arlington Traditional, what are the different neighborhood schools where they reside that that attend that school? And so there's there's that's kind of the two purpose of the data is one, the demographic breakdown, and then secondly, the neighborhood school breakdown. Um, it is a lot of information, totally understand and, and, and relate to that. And, and we're happy to, you know, work with certain groups if there's anything we can uh, help, you know, make comprehensive, more comprehensible um, and accessible. Um, but we just wanted in the interest of transparency, we wanted to share what was shared with instructional leaders as they were doing this work and um, uh, putting that information together. So. Thank you, Jonathan. Bridget, where can folks get information on what programs are used in reading, math, et cetera, and the evaluation APS uses to evaluate the effectiveness of those? Sure, so um, I will say uh, absolutely your school, your principal, your teachers are really the, the best uh, source uh, to, to learn more about um, the resources and the um, uh, sort of instructional philosophy and pedagogy uh, uh, as it relates to any content area. But that said, um, certainly uh, when you uh, go to the APS website under uh, teaching and learning and, and pull up the uh, various web pages of our content areas under curriculum and instruction, such as math, uh, English reading. Uh, there's information about resources that are being used. There's also information in our program evaluation. So each uh, content area um, uh, undergoes a, a really rigorous evaluation process um, every five years. Um, the uh, pandemic threw us off a little bit, so the World Languages program evaluation actually took about six years. Um, uh, but it, uh, that program evaluation really um, ask some long range uh, questions about the efficacy of the resources, of the instructional ped pedagogy. Uh, it uh, it uh, involves uh, classroom observations, um, uh, uh, feedback and interviews with uh, various stakeholders. And so um, uh, those former evaluation reports are also on our website and can really give you a good look at a um, sort of a five year span. Uh, those program evaluations also include action plans. Uh, so it gives you a sense of, of um, you know, what went well and what um, what do we need to improve on and what's the action plan um, that we're working on as well. 
So those would, um, I guess those three areas, your school, uh, the uh, the curricular uh, websites, uh, and then certainly uh, the program evaluations can give you um, a, a good understanding of the of the, the breadth and scope of, of the delivery of, of instruction in various content areas. Thank you, Bridget. What are the benchmarks for your visioning processes? Are they annual goals or will they stretch further to longer range? For example, the equity goals will take long range planning. Right, and we were really careful to acknowledge and highlight that our new equity policy is um, a, one of the guiding um, um, factors in, in our IPP. And um, I would agree that uh, that will take um, uh, years uh, to, to achieve some of the goals in our equity policy. So um, if you uh, take a look at um, the, the several uh, initiatives in which we're focusing on now, for example, as Jonathan emphasized, um, none of those would go into effect until at least the 22 23 school year and that's because um, we uh, need to take a look at space and capacity. Uh, if we are um, co-locating a program, we need to look at staffing. Uh, if we're creating a new program, for example, the um, K through eight MPSA, excuse me, um, Montessori program, um, you know, that uh, requires uh, uh, curriculum work and pedagogy work uh, to ensure that um, there is a continuity in the delivery of that instruction. So, um, um, uh, while the, the cycle happens on a yearly basis, it is absolutely accurate that as some of these recommendations will take time to um, reach fruition. Um, so as far as our benchmarks, I think we, um, uh, because if you recall, one of the goals of the IPP is to help us manage um, in, uh, in student enrollment uh, and to use instruction to lead instructional needs to manage that student enrollment. And so um, one of the benchmarks is that we need to look at where do we have students who are over or underrepresented in, in programs? Where are their capacity needs um, that need to be addressed? And what are some of the, uh, so that would be a benchmark. And then the next question or, or benchmark is what are the um, the instructional um, supports that are sort of driving uh, the uh, solutions that we're identifying? Um, so I, I hope that answered the question. Thank you. So, since I have you up there, before I go to Jonathan, um, are you looking at the impact of the programs on segregations on schools? Are you looking at neighborhood schools that see higher rates of families choosing other programs? You know, actually, I think uh, because Jonathan is representing the planning and evaluation side of the house, I'm going to defer to him uh, to, to respond to that. Okay. Yes, no, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, um, we are. We are definitely looking at program locations and looking at the demographic composition. And, you know, that was, I think, with the middle school C recommendation from Lieber is identifying that you know as we look at equity of access to programs based on where they're located um, based on uh, you know whether we provide transportation uh, to, to that program um, all of those factors definitely weigh in here um, there are certain schools that do have a, a higher percentage of students who transfer out into programs and that is absolutely something we need to look at um, for a variety of uh, reasons um, and uh, in helping shape our visioning. So uh, that will absolutely factor into our work um, as we continue to unpack and, and look at the data and look at our needs. Um, these are areas uh, that we are uh, mindful of. And as we think about equity and access and diversity across our schools, uh, we'll, we'll be um, worked into this process and have, have already been, as you saw from the middle school seat recommendation. Jonathan, how will community demand, as evidenced by applications or waitlist numbers, factor into your considerations for future for the future of option programs? Yeah, that is definitely a, an important consideration. I think first and foremost it, it is uh, as we look at the performance of the program or the needs of the students being met, um, access, equity. 
uh, who's being served from the program, to what extent, and uh, our strategic plan goals and, and, and vision. Uh, those are really going to be our, our, our key guiding principles. And then we look at, you know, demand as well. Um, I, I think, um, you know, many of our programs with uh, um, high demand are also high performing. So a lot of times there is a natural fit, but demand in itself is not necessarily the sole driver. Um, our strategic plan goals, mission, vision, equity, access, all of those uh, really play a role as we think about um, you know, the future of the program and any recommendations to uh, help strengthen it, um, whether it's expansion, whether it's uh, program move, all of those things kind of weigh into it. So yes, demand is, it, it is, it is an important consideration uh, among several. Um, Jonathan, um, our, our folks are asking, what is the plan to ensure that we're reaching all sorts of families in the engagement process? Mm -hmm. um, of course, they have specific questions like, are there going to be sessions in other languages? Are you going to have focus groups? You know what? Are we using any other technology that um, is 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 utilized um, by other groups like WhatsApp, for example, um, which we are that are more accessible for a certain demographic group? Um, mm -hmm. And maybe, of course, you could talk about the targeted outreach, but also our you know, collaboration with school and community relations and then that whole entire team that we have there. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Sure, sure, yeah. So we are the virtual community meetings um, that we have planned for tomorrow night and next week. Uh, will be uh, in our five main APS languages. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided. Uh, so uh, families in those languages that in the five main languages will have uh, access uh, via telephone or uh, through this. And we do have a mechanism uh, via uh, for for um, the person who is uh, the interpreter who is manning the interpretation line will be able to feed questions from the, the people he's interpreting to into a document for presenters. So they will be able to engage with the presenters and ask questions as well. Um, we have open office hours uh, that will be available in English and Spanish. Uh, we are running uh, focus groups at the schools that would be most impacted. Uh, for you know, as I mentioned, Academic Academy, Kenmore, and there are several others. We will be running focus groups with um, <clears throat> and meetings with some of their staff and students at the secondary level and engaging that way and also working collaboratively with our school and community relations team to use those different platforms like WhatsApp. Um, we met today with our bilingual family resource assistants and talked with them about the engagement process and enlisting their help and helping reach some of the families who traditionally uh, don't participate in these processes or may not have the information. Uh, they really have some critical relationships in their school community um, and we're, we're going to be partnering closely with those bilingual family resource assistants to uh, help uh, promote engagement and, and foster that participation in this process. So we have multiple ways, uh, multiple technological mediums, multiple uh, meeting formats to really help uh, have a broad outreach and broad representation in this process. It is really our goal and aim to ensure that it is representative of the APS community. That's what we are striving for and, and working to uh, to ensure happens. Yeah, I have to have to add because we, um, you know, the meeting with the bilingual family liaisons, it's, it's so, it just, you know, we meet with them constantly, but today specifically, they have so many ideas in reaching their families whom they know best. Um, and they have so many different strategies at the school level, and this is why we communicate with them. They also have key communicators with um, whom they communicate with, and they work very, very closely with principals in doing additional outreach that they are only able to do, you know, at the school level. These folks are passionate. We're so thankful for them um, because we have them, you know, they're out there um, at every school level that, like Jonathan um, said, and they're just so passionate and use WhatsApp, for example, or flyers or um, so many other things. And we do work very, very closely with them. So I just wanted to stress that because um, our meetings with them go so well and they, they just give us so many ideas and they do the work um, themselves. So we're just very thankful on that. Um, um, Jonathan, will 
it's about the immersion visioning. Will does APS commit that the immersion visioning will be completed in time to include it in the budget and CIP process? If not, how will capacity be dealt with in between now and when changes can come out of the next budget cycle and CIP? Yes, so our goal in this next IPP cycle, which the immersion visioning process is part of, <clears throat> is to be able to bring forth to the uh, community and school board uh, some suggestions as we did last week at the February 4th. We plan to do that at the end of October next year. So that will be kind of our some of our draft suggestions. And then again, engage in a community input process through November of next year and really deliver those the final recommendations in December, January. But with the timeline we have developed, um, we fully expect to deliver recommendations from the immersion visioning process that can be built into the budget and if needed, the CIP cycle. Um, so that is absolutely, we've, we've worked diligently to align um, our work and timeline to, uh, to meet those goals. So that is very much the, the, the plan. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Bridget, hmm. where is my Bridget? There she is. OK, for the Career Center with recommendations. Posted in October. And then some decisions made in December. Does the whole renovation planning process have to start all over again? We have a CC work group and a B. LPC already, how much from scratch will we be starting again? Right, so um, as many of you may be aware, the, the school board uh, did some after action um, review uh, last month, I believe, um, of the planning for um, the the renovation and the, the um, sort of visioning for the, the career center. And that there was, uh, that was the culmination of a lot of work, um, both by staff and community members in providing feedback and, and uh, trying to come to, to um, a vision uh, for the, the Career Center. And um, many of you may be also aware that, um, you know, the board um, uh, recognized and, and uh, opted not to move forward in part because of, of the price tag. Uh, and so as part of that after action review, uh, the board has directed staff to um, uh, look at uh, visioning options and um, use of the building that will not exceed um, a specific cost. Um, and so uh, the, the question of, you know, are we going back uh, to scratch? No, I think we've learned a lot um, from the initial visioning. Um, I think we uh, need to, at this point, make some decisions about what we can um, apply to the um, to the planning for the Career Center um, that that uh, meets that that cost benchmark and and what we won't be able to afford to do. Um, and all of that is happening with the uh, intention and visioning of how can we um, create a state of the art uh, CTE uh, experience uh, for our students that will really leverage their uh, their learning into uh, some of the, the 21st uh, century skills uh, and workforce that they'll they'll be entering. So we've got sort of these dual uh, dynamics of um, a, a cost to ceiling and um, really being smart about our visioning so that we can meet um, uh, some of those goals. So it was important to to go back to the drawing board to learn uh, from um, uh, some of the, the dynamic and innovative ideas that came forth and some of the mistakes that were made so that we can uh, get it right the next uh, this next time around. Thank you, Bridget. Where is the staff work on what is happening to improve instruction at the neighborhood schools? Where is the visioning process on each aspect of instruction at the neighborhood schools? Right, and so at this point, um, we have uh, acknowledged that the neighborhood schools are uh, important uh, and a cornerstone of our delivery of instruction is, uh, as part of the IPP. Uh, we talked about how uh, there may come a time when we need to um, uh, incorporate the neighborhood schools into uh, the um, 
uh, audits and program uh, criteria and evaluation. Um, and we're not uh, there yet. So um, I will say, though, that the expectation for the delivery of instruction in the variety of content areas, math, science, social studies, arts, PE, English, reading, um, are really um, being driven from the Department of Teaching and Learning uh, through the program evaluation process, uh, through the, uh, the vetting of research-based best practices. Uh, and so uh, in my response to that previous conversation of where can I find what uh, resources are being used, how we've evaluated the efficacy of those resources and strategies, um, I would say at this point, it's important to take a look at them through the program evaluations that are posted on our website. Um, and then uh, as we uh, begin to refine our focus on, on neighborhood schools, uh, that will um, um, be outlined in uh, the IPP Engage page as well. Thank you, Bridget. Jonathan, are you focusing are you focusing exclusively on existing seats or will there be recommendations for introducing new seats via new buildings or expansions? Yeah, so that um, as we continue to build out the IPP and, and look at our vision, um, we absolutely the the career center, the as Bridget just mentioned, those those seats there that have been you know put into prior year CIPs and, and built into the process those those seats um, as we will are are currently part of it but as we look to the future absolutely as we look at our projections and our future seat needs that we will need to incorporate um, there is a process of site studies and uh, as we continue to identify working collaboratively with the joint facility advisory council and our facility advisory council and other groups on on sites and then developing a vision, um, as we've been saying a lot, instruction before construction. So helping provide a clear vision uh, before we really embark on a lot of these projects. So we know we know from projections what some of our needs are, providing a clear kind of direction, instructional direction for the future, and then working with our facilities and other groups to kind of execute that uh, from a siting perspective and, and working. So that will absolutely be part of the uh, the IPP process and working collaboratively with um, planning and evaluation in our facility and operations department and, and uh, other key groups. Thank you, Jonathan. If dual language enrollment will be a spring summer visioning process focus, does this also, sorry, this is written a little funky, let me see. Does the IPP goal address demographic and capacity throughout the county? Will that be a particular focus too? Um, I the the dual enrollment, um, dual language enrollment, the dual language. Are you talking the the? I'm going to assume that this is about the uh, immersion visioning, the dual language immersion visioning. I we will look at that. Yeah. yeah, we'll look at that program. Um, we will, as we look at the feeder structure for both Key and Claremont and then the kind of K-12 pathway, that will all be evaluated. Uh, building capacity, demographics, uh, program size, um, all of those uh, will, will be part of the process, uh, demographics and capacity. It absolutely has to be. As much as it's a vision, there's a pragmatic component to this of two and working within our existing facilities. Uh, we can certainly make plans to, to address things in the future, but there is a kind of here and now component too. So uh, similar to the career center visioning and being able to deliver that at a, a cost that's financially feasible uh, as we look at capacity and demographics, all of those uh, within our existing framework as we make plans for the future too. So that, that will be uh, um, part of it, addressing those needs. Jonathan, I know that you um, spoke previously about the data. This is from the same person, Kim, um, and, and, and you know, it's about the data. Um, in, in her view, it's it's very difficult at the career center when they're in a diff when they're in a building with many different programs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you wanted to add any more to that. I think this is more of a con it is a comment, not a question. But she said the data is program specific and not aggregated by school location is that so yeah so on the data set on the excel sheet um it does list the program and then the location of the program in the school um on it in excel i know uh, on excel there there is a, a relatively simple way 
Um, and I'm happy to, to whoever asked if they want to email me separately. You can sort that column by school and then you can see every program that exists in that school. We provided the kind of default setting of that data sheet is by program, but the school is listed and by using the filters in Excel, you can sort by school and so you can get a look at all the programs at, 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 the, at that particular school. So um, whoever asked the question, feel free to email me directly and I'm happy to help support or any colleague on that we can help as well. And we'll uh, we'll make sure that um, people who are digging in are able to navigate. That's that's no problem. Right. Um, since you're up there, before I go on, um, is there a draft IPP document somewhere? So the current the current draft is from September 2019. That was the last uh, current draft. We are, as we've continued to build out this vision and framework, we are again gathering input from our um, a variety of folks this month. And once we kind of have um, just on a decision moving forward, we will be going back to that draft document and and building upon the work. Um, as we mentioned at the board meeting, those who were tuned in last week, um, the prior document, we're not discarding that. We are building upon that work. The um, initial IPP was really a, a K to 12, and it focused on those six programs like IB and Immersion who have that multi-level pathway. But as um, Bridget and I were planning the summer working with leaders, we, we chose to take a more holistic view of our instructional program, expanded it pre-K to adult, and included all programs. Because as we look at that vision for multiple pathways for students, we realize that as we think about multiple pathways to success, it's not just based on those that have that linear progression, such as immersion or IB. There are multiple pathways and multiple programs and combinations of neighborhood schools that provide students uh, to meet their goals and needs. So um, we will continue to build onto that document from September 2019. Um, as, as soon as this vision is, you know, with the board and, uh, and other stakeholders, we will get back to that and uh, We'll, we'll have a draft ready this spring, an updated draft, so people uh, can see all of this kind of put together on that document. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Bridget, what, um, will your visioning also expand to summer school and expanding that programming, particularly during this environment of COVID? You know, really the planning for summer school is uh, in the sort of domain um, or is led by the Department of Teaching and Learning. Um, we uh, look at how do we assess um, student need uh, for summer school and work through uh, with the schools in that way. And then our content supervisors work to develop um, offerings uh, for summer school in um, particularly uh, for last year and this uh, summer coming up, summer 2021, um, we know that uh, the full distance learning experience um, uh, has caused several students to need additional interventions to ensure that they've got a strong foundation uh, before they move on to the next um, level. And so, and particularly for this school year, we anticipate we'll have far more students who will need um, interventions and strengthening. Um, and so uh, we are preparing to be able to offer a robust summer school experience. That said, uh, to the question of is that incorporated in the IPP? Not at this time. It uh, continues to remain as part of um, the responsibility of, of of teaching and learning, and then certainly in partnership with uh, facilities and operations um, as we as we move uh, forward to to citing our summer school um, um, schools. Bridget, how? Our student learning out student learning outcomes used to inform the IPP. Right, so I'll use is um, some specific examples. Uh, one of the uh, that coming from uh, this cycle of the IPP, as uh, Jonathan pointed out, uh, we've our secondary. Um, principals, our high school principals really had uh, been looking at, um, you know, would it benefit our students and their learning outcomes, our English learner students to consolidate um, some programs. And um, uh, as Jonathan indicated, I think our, our leaders really landed on that we need to do some more um, work on that uh, before we can land on a specific recommendation. But we're really looking at um, 
you know, uh, data such as dropout rates with uh, for our English learners, um, our uh, our older English learners as well, their progression from different uh, WIDA levels, uh, so that they're uh, progressing towards more proficiency with the uh, the English language, and so using the um, the WIDA access tests uh, and the outcomes of those to help uh, inform. You know, um, we currently have four separate secondary uh, English learner programs. Um, each has a, a slightly different flavor. Some have older students, for example. Um, some have, uh, we have a, a program located at our Arlington Community High School, which has um, um, a different focus than uh, the program that's uh, located at the L Institute at the Career Center. So really looking at student, uh, their L student performance on the access test, on uh, uh, looking at dropout rates, looking at unique needs uh, for our, our older English learners who are often working uh, to help support their families. And so um, uh, looking at those outcomes as well, really help inform some of the decision making um, as we think about would they be better served by consolidating um, uh, those programs. Thank you, Bridget. Jonathan, I have some questions and let me see, I'm going to check the time, make sure I honor it. Yes. OK, um, how will how how will the IPP help inform how to address the projected need for extra 800 high school seats? Yeah, so the the career center site is really uh, our, our a big. Uh, it's our, our one of the major ways we're going to meet our high school seat needs in the near future. That has been funded in prior CIP processes and, and built into our planning. So that has got to be a big answer for that. The IPP has really helped provide an instructional vision for the seats. Uh, so as we provide that clear vision and then working again collaboratively with planning and evaluation and facility and operations to kind of execute that vision, uh, working on siting, <clears throat> we have uh, site studies that are undergoing, uh, collaboration again with JFAC and our Facility Advisory Council on siting. So uh, the IPP is really designed to provide an instructional vision for those seats. Um, is really, I think, the best answer I can provide on that. Thank you. Um, what data or evidence are you examining to substantiate scaling APS investment in Montessori options? Very specific question. Yeah, I'm sorry. One more time, Gladys. What data or evidence are you examining to substantiate scaling APS investment in Montessori options? So uh, one thing, the, the Montessori model is, uh, particularly at the elementary level, is based on three-year learning cycles and, and kind of, pl planes, of the de planes of development, as they call them in Montessori. And so we currently have a system uh, with our current Montessori program where the students, um, kindy, uh, the pre-K and kindergarten, uh, the three, four, five-year-olds and, and some six, but the pre-K and K are together in that three-year cycle. And then you have the first, second, and third, and then fourth and fifth. So that there is kind of that missing year. Those sixth graders uh, would really being part of the program would help complete that three-year cycle. So in a traditional Montessori program, they go through three three-year cycles uh, through that program. Um, to get accredited by the American uh, Montessori Society, uh, you need to have a sixth grade program to have those three year cycles and have the students complete those different plane, planes of development. And so um, that is a big part of it. There's uh, you know data and research on the model that supports and advocates for that approach of completing those cycles. And I think instructional leaders, um, as they weighed out that and realizing, well, if sixth grade alone is, is taken from, uh, the sixth grade Montessori program is pulled from Gunston and just seventh and eighth remains, it really would have an adverse effect on the program at Gunston, just leaving the seventh and eighth graders there uh, alone. So um, the the decision from instructional leaders was to put forth a suggestion that they should be included within the K to eight model, co-located next to a middle school so that if there are any seventh, eighth graders who need a high school level course, for example, an eighth grader who might be accelerated in math and needs algebra two, uh, the Montessori may not be able to offer that and so they could go into the middle school and access. That's just a hypothetical example um, of that. So I think those were some of the key drivers 
uh, from an instructional standpoint of why uh, where they landed on that suggestion. And then, of course, the uh, capacity piece and, and projections and efficiencies weighs into that as well. But the instructional piece was really a driver in those three year development cycles and, and, and the Montessori model. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, there is one question on location, um, you know, sort of how is location considered in the visioning process? So I think um, as we look at, you know, uh, the program demographics, issues of equity and access, who's able to access the program, where it's located, transportation, uh, families capacity. For example, we know some of our families don't have cars, and so uh, are certain sites accessible by public transportation if they needed to go to meetings for their child, act, be part of the school community? So absolutely, those are all factors as we continue to look at uh, equity and access, program location, uh, all of the factors around our programs, absolutely, um, you know, that program location ties into a lot of our goals around equity, around access, around um, meeting the needs of our students in our community and families. Thank you, Jonathan. It's 7.56, so Bridget, I'm going to, I have, I think, one more, one more question for you. Do you think each option school should have a path through the APS system? Like if you start with immersion, do you go all the way through? Or if you start with a traditional ATS, do you go all the way through? Um, or are you open to viewing pathways that aren't linear? Right, so to speak specifically to the question, I'm not sure that I do think that each um, option school has a pathway, but I'm not uh, the, the sole owner of the IPP. Um, and so if I take you back, if you remember that visual of the cycle of the IPP, that question might be brought to our instructional leaders um, who uh, will certainly have some uh, some opinions. And then we uh, bring that to uh, the community and then form recommendations after hearing um, both from our leaders and, and the community. That said, I think we do have some some linear uh, pathways, as, as you mentioned, the IB is one, the dual language immersion uh, program is another that I think most folks would, uh, would agree. Uh, and then there may be some um, nonlinear pathways. Uh, so you might consider, for example, um, uh, thinking about the expeditionary learning that's happening at Campbell. Uh, and should a kid um, who uh, really um, um, uh, you know, grows in uh, and demonstrates an affinity for uh, expeditionary learning, um, you know, perhaps that um, they then want to move uh, to IB or they'd like to move to potentially the, the arts and, um, and technology programs at, at Kenmore. So I think, um, you know, the IPP itself um, per, first of all, gives information about all uh, option uh, programs uh, in one place so that families and students can um, really consider what their options are. And then it may be able to um, provide uh, um, opportunities for pathways that um, families may be interested in pursuing and that um, students maybe want to want to create their own pathways uh, moving forward. So I think it starts with you know, a, um, a, an articulation of our option programs, uh, a recognition that our option programs and, and, and schools um, fit with our strategic plan, um, have a, a level of efficacy with our, our vi vision and a mission, and then um, allow uh, families to uh, consider the variety of pathways that might be out there for them. Thank you, Bridget. I think that's a great summary, especially to those that have very, very specific questions on programs or past programs or past policies and, and changing in policies and why things were done. Um, I would add that, you know, the IPP framework may include recommendation to expand current programs, to change or modify existing programs, to create new programs, to move programs to new sites, to consolidate programs, to eliminate programs, to, you know, like slide five, for example, that you guys showed. So um, I think the, the, the slides are a great presentation, especially to those. Um, oh, let me, since I'm speaking, I should probably show my face in closing. Thank you, Bridget and Jonathan, for allowing me to 
to do that. Um, so I would say as PTAs, ambassadors, and um, community leaders, this uh, recording will be available to you. Um, will be available to you. And I know as leaders, you do end up answering a lot of these questions. You are our key communicators. I really appreciate that. We appreciate your questions, your feedback, your comments um, and everything we do. And thank you for always um, being able to participate with us. We understand that we can never choose a date that works for everybody. Um, this is why we're going to have these available. Thank you for your comments and your questions. Um, in keeping us um, to make sure that you know we reach families as best as we can. That is definitely a passion that we have as well. So thank you to the team. Thank you to all of you um, for joining in. And as always, um, you can always reach out to us. You can always reach out via engage, engage at APSVA.us. And that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you.